Uh, okay, this week uh, we are going to discuss a new um, architecture of um, new network, which is called an autoencoder. And uh, um, for cybersecurity, I think it, it is a very important structure because it can be used for some kind of uh, anomaly detection, and uh, we will show you later. Okay, so um, the, defin um, the definition of autoencoder uh, is right here, but um, I think you can read it by yourself. But I would like to um, go over some um, interesting things right here. Okay, um, first, um, usually when we uh, talk about learning, we will um, divide uh, different architectures into different categories. Okay, the first one is called supervised learning. And, um, okay, take a look at the um, this figure, okay, the black one, okay. Um, usually we will have um, data right here, and we have a feature, okay, We uh, it is represented as the big X, right? And we have a um, um, target, which is the uh, lowercase y right here, and we have n data point. So we can use this X, big X, and Y to perform some kind of learning. And in neural network, okay, we will um, set up a network like this, right? We have um, M different features. And we have N data points. And you, we use a neural network, no matter if it is a dense network or it is a convolution neural network, which is okay. And uh, we have um, corresponding weights, okay, to be trained by using the N data point. So the corresponding uh, features x1 to xm and its y will be used in its those function right so those function would be um and usually if it is a categorical data we use uh cross entropy right and if it is a numerical data of y we use uh, mse usually so um no matter what function you use okay this function should be um parameter should has uh, parameters okay theta and if you input x and y right here so you can use use um gradient descent to minimize this those value because you have we have x and um y so um we call this supervised learning we have a um, target to train the, the model right so that is the supervised learning okay uh for the second one okay the green one which is called um supervised learning so um, it is right here Okay, in the middle, we can see that uh, we, we don't have a um, specific um, column code target. So basically, it is just a bunch of data sets. Okay, we have a data set, and each of the data set, uh, each of the data has uh, M different features. Since we don't have a um, target, so uh, in the previous uh, lecture, we can view this kind of data as a um, data point, n data point, in a m dimension space, right? So um, in such kind of algorithm, we, we need to define an important concept, which is a distance. We have several different distances, such as Euclidean distance, um, Minkowski distance, uh, Manhattan distance, uh, causal similarity, um, Jaka distance, something like that. So we use those distance functions to help us to uh, define or to figure out what is the relationship between those data points. And most of the time, we um, use those distance to calculate the distance matrix and to figure out uh, which data point which data point is uh, more close to uh, closer to the other ones, and if they some of the data points, they form a cluster. So uh, if we don't have a specific Y, which is target value, and we use such kind of uh, method to analyze the data, okay? So the next one is, uh, we'd like to talk about, is the uh, blue one, okay? 
the blue one is that um, when, when we collect the data, we don't we, we still don't have um, target Y. Okay, but we can uh, manually create the target value from its features. Okay, so uh, basically we have a for example a G function. Okay, and uh, we can input all the features x1 to xm as its parameter and use the G function to generate a new target y as its corresponding target. Okay, so after that we can use the uh, the algorithm we used in supervised learning to learn the uh, relationship between this big x and uh, uh, the function y. Okay, uh, it looks a little bit strange, right? But um, sometimes um, that is the one of the way to uh, to design your um, system. And we will, we will um, go over some uh, interesting uh, self supervised learning examples. Okay, so the first one we like to teach you is autoencode, which is the uh, name. Of this class node, okay, which is autoencode, and for the next week we will talk about language model, and this um, I think most of the language model also adapt such kind of um, self supervised supervised learning um, method, okay. So again, <coughs> uh, I would like to show you some uh, interesting about um, autoencoder, okay. So uh, again, uh, let's take uh, this figure from left hand side to the right hand side. Okay. Um, in the first beginning, uh, at the first beginning, and we will have um, a data point. Okay. So uh, assume it has m features for each uh, data point. So um, it is it is this set of all the features is big X, right? And for the autoencoder, this structure usually um, divided into two separate uh, new networks. The left hand side is the encoder, which is right here, and the right hand side is the decoder. Okay, so uh, for the encoder, you, and of course you can, um, so there is um, a neural network right here, and here's another neural network right here. So. Um, this neural network, the encoder, usually you can use any structure you like. For example, you can use dense, net, dense layer, you can use a convolution layer, and even you can use um, a re recurrent neural network. Because it, it is okay. It is um, okay to use uh, different types of um, neural network layers. And uh, this is interesting. There's one interesting thing is that um, to perform the encoder, okay. For example, we use a dense dense layer, which is the simplest one, okay. So um, we use a dense layer to connect the features and the first the hidden layer, the second hidden layer, and so on and so forth. So at the end, okay. For example, uh, this encoder will output uh, a new. Um, <coughs> vectors which is called big z okay and we assume that the, the, the z um, vector has k dimension so we have z1 z2 to zk okay so basically you can um you can view this encoder as a um, dimension reduction or you can view it as a um, uh, space uh, transformation we transform the data the end data points from uh, m dimension right so uh, that is the m dimension and through the encoder okay there are several different layers and at the end the dimension will be k dimension right so all the n data points will be transformed from m dimension to another space which is k dimension and this space has a uh, a name. Okay, it is it is called latent space. Okay, latent space. And usually, when we design an autoencoder, 
the side, the the length, uh, the M should be bigger than K. So it is somehow. Uh, <coughs> So this is somehow uh, a, a method which can achieve dimension reduction. Okay, so that is the first very first part. Okay, we'll have what we call encoder. So the, the decoder is um, symmetric to the encoder, but it is um, opposite. The direction is opposite. You can see that uh, the decoder also has a purple neural network. Okay, and it transformed the original Z space to that is its output to another space, okay, which is also M dimensions. So that it you, you can view it as uh increase the dimension from K to M. Okay, so um, basically this structure looks a little bit strange, but it uh, transform the end data point from the original space, which is a big X, the M dimension, and perform dimension reduction to the Z space, which has only K dimension. And it, it further use the decoder to restore or to, to uh, go back to a new space which is called X prime and it also has M dimension and usually this very important things is that since it is a self-supervised learning so in this case we don't have Y right so basically that big X prime is you can view it as Y it's our target and our loss function should be something like this is MSE function and we have to compare that point in X space and X prime space and we wish those data points will be restored so basically the MSE looks like this we don't have Y, but we, we have X prime. We wish the data point in the original space will be projected to Z, then in space. And then this data point will be further transformed back to X prime. And we wish the X prime will be very, very, very close to X. Okay? So that is what we call self-supervised learning. We don't have X, but we have a, a target. The target is the original space itself. In these cases, okay, uh, so uh, we have an encoder and decoder, right? Uh, the left-hand side, the neural network is called encoder. The right-hand side, the purple network is called decoder. So basically, they have their own parameters. So we write theta E and theta D right here. So basically you can view it as um, we have a original input big X and we perform a neural network with its corresponding parameters theta E and the output would be the Z. And we further use the Z as an input of the decoder and the decoder has its parameter theta D and the corresponding output would be X prime. And there's an important thing is that uh, usually, okay, the size of the, we say that the dimension of Z will be less than the dimension of X and X prime. So you can see that it, it, it can be viewed as, as some kind of compressed compression because all the end data point will be in M dimension originally and will be project to a lower dimension which has only k, di k dimensions okay so you can represent a data originally it is m dimension but you can represent the data 
now using only k, k dimension. So we, we, we also call it the dimension reduction method. It is very relate, very similar to PCA. We introduced PCA before, right? But PCA used some uh, method to, to help us to find the uh, um, most significant principal component, right? But in this case, we don't need to deal with the, uh, the statistics and variance. We simply just use two neural networks to help us to, to perform dimension induction. Okay, so that is the, an interesting structure called autoencoder. Uh, there are some um, useful, um, there are some application that uh, rely on the autoencoder, for example. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some um, example later, okay? But, uh, but I think I can mention some application right now. The first one is dimension induction. And uh, for some uh, project, okay, maybe the M will be a very large number, for example, 500 or 1,000. So it is very difficult to um, build a neural network which has 1,000 features. And it costs a lot of computation time. It also costs a lot of memories. And also, you need to store those information in your disk, right? So you have, if you have such kind of autoencoder, and those autoencoder can nearly perfectly restore the x prime from a smaller dimension, which is z, and this z, then the space can wellly represent the original data in m dimension right so basically we can use z to represent the data not use big x to represent the data right so if you use z to represent data you have a smaller size of vectors and you simply just use those z values to design the the, the later uh, neural network the later sv you can use uh, the z value on, for example, uh, linear regression, logic regression, SVM. You don't, you don't have, you don't really have to use the original big X. Okay, because uh, the reason why we we sometimes we like to use the the linear space, not the original space, is because uh, when you collect the data x1 and xm to xm there are a lot of features which are uh, correlated take uh, for example uh, I have example right here if you collect uh, your um, height in centimeters and you some some your colleagues they collect the information of um, a student by using meter. So basically, x1, x2, okay, what this, uh, it is 170, and the other is 1.7. Basically, they represent the same meanings, but you, but maybe you you have thousands of features, so you, you you don't check those features. So x1 and x2, they are redundant data to each other, right? So basically, if you use um, an encoder to encode your data to the lens space and this lens space can perfectly restore the original data okay there are some information there's some knowledge will be stored in theta e and theta d okay so the information will be compressed to the lens space okay so you can use a more simpler representation to represent the data okay by using only k dimension not m dimension okay so that is one of the uh, useful uh, thing if you adopt auto auto code in your dash uh, in your neural network structure okay so the first one is dimension induction okay we'll talk about some application later okay so that is one of the things so uh, let's take a look at how do we Use TensorFlow Keras to uh, write an autoencoder. Okay, so uh, the data set that we use is called Fashion, uh, Fashion MLST. Okay, so basically they are uh, 
pixel images. Okay, I make pixel images, and the size of the image is twenty eight pixel by twenty eight pixels. So uh, let's first take a look at uh, this one, because it is a very um, base, very um, well known data set. So you can simply just use a very in simple function to load the data directly from the um, Python packages. Okay. And as we can see that uh, it provides uh, two different data sets, one for testing, the other for training. And you can see that uh, the shape is right here. So we have um, 60,000 images. And each one is 28 by 28 pixels. So that is used for training. And the other 10,000 are used for testing. Okay. And right here, you can see that um, because it is a, a grayscale pixel image, so basically it is an 8-bit grayscale picture. So uh, the range of each pixel right here will be between 0 to 255. So that is a reason why at the first beginning, all the pixel value will be divided by 251. Uh, 255 so uh, after do so after doing such kind of pre-processing the each pixel will be represented by a um, number between 0, 0.0 to 1.0 it um it really doesn't matter if you um, normalize the data okay but um it is a trick it, uh, we will show you why it is a trick okay so um, basically you have such kind of things. So, um, <coughs> so that is the structure. Okay. We first take a look at the structure. Okay. Originally, we have um, 80, uh, 28 by 28 pixel. Okay. And the values is between 0, 0.0 to 1.0 okay so um for the auto encoder okay we have to design the, the encoder and the decoder so for the decoder uh, for the encoder sorry for the encoder it, uh, this example is a very simple example so it has only uh, one layer the first thing is that we still use sequential to design our encoder and decoder okay the first um, layer we use in the encoder is flatten, okay? Because it, it is a 28 by 28 pixel. So if we perform flatten, it means, okay, we put the first pixel to the first factor right here. So put the 28 pixel right here. And for the 29 pixel will be placed right here. So basically, if you flatten an image, okay, um, it will become a uh, 784 vector. It is a vector which has 70, 100, 784 items. So we simply just flatten the image. Okay, it is, uh, I mentioned it is a very simple structure. Okay, usually we don't do so, but it, it, it is just an example. So that is the first layer. Okay, the second layer is a dense layer. Uh, the dense layer has a lantern dimension, which is 64, it's right here. That is a design, okay? So we design a new layer right here, and it has 64 neurons, okay? And it used ReLU as its activation function. Okay, so that is the encoder it is a very simple one okay and for the decoder again it is also a sequential model and it has a dense layer right here so basically it is symmetric structure so the green one right here is the, the decoder so we design a layer which has 784 neurons which is exactly the same as this one and further we reshape the image the the vector to 28 by 28 
So it is a symmetric structure. And when you design an autoencoder, although we don't, although it is not a, not necessary to be symmetrical, but usually we do so. So it, the decoder and the, the encoder looks like the same. Okay, but there's one thing which is important that um, at the end of at the end of the deco um, at the first layer of the decoder. The activation function it used right here is sigmoid because sigmoid has range between 0 to 1.0. Remember that at the first beginning, we have we normalized the grayscale, 8 bit grayscale image, right? Divided by 255, so the range will be between 0 and 1. Okay? So that is a trick. We use a sigmoid function right here as the activation function so that the output of the green layer right here will be between 0 and 1, which is matches to the input. And after that, we need to design our loss function. So it's very simple. Uh, the loss function can be applied on the blue vectors and the green vectors. We wish, okay, we hope. Okay, um, six, th since we have 60,000 images, right? We have 60,000 data points right here. And we wish of them, their green vectors and the blue vectors right here will be as close as possible. Even though there is a compressed there's a compression in the latent space, which has only 64 dimension. So that the, the, the neural network right at the encoder and decoder, they should cooperate with each other to preserve the information as many, as much as possible in that latent space. So when they restore the image from the landing space to the green vector, the green vector will be very, 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 very similar to the original blue vectors right here. That is, that is the, a, very, a very simple hold on coder. Okay, so uh, basically uh, take a look at this call function. So the X will be in, uh, used as an input in the encoder. So the output will be encoded. And that is the dependent space we use. And the encode date will be used as the input in decoder. And the output will be decoded. So we will use the uh, decoded and the input X to perform uh, our loss function, which is MSE, they should be as as similar as possible. If when we input sixty thousand images and the corresponding parameters right here, so there will be a theta e and theta d right here. Those those weight will be trained. To perform such kind of re re restore. Okay. So again, uh, we have a compile right here. We we use add-in. We'll talk about uh, optimize later, and then we use the training data. It has sixty thousand images. We have ten epochs. Uh, we shuffle every time when we um, perform different epochs, and we use the text data as the validation. And as you can see, that um, the loss decreased, which means those theta d and theta e are trended, will be trended. Okay, so after that, uh, we can use the um, encoder and decoder, okay, to, to uh, print them. So as you can see that uh, the upper row is the original x, okay, the lower row is the x prime. Okay, since we can, <clears throat> so that is the x prime, that is the x. 
So we use, we use the same image. <coughs> so the upper one is the original one. The lower one is the X prime. As, as you can see that because the information has been compressed in the lantern space. So when you restore or reconstruct it, reconstruct the image, there's there's some information are lost. Right? Because from my pers uh, from my opinion, um, the lantern space right here, the dimension is a little is a little bit uh, small small, because originally you have a seven hundred and eighty four dimension to uh, record uh, to store your image, but now you have only sixty four dimension. So it is some information will be lost when you perform such kind of dimension reduction. So when you reconstruct the image to back to seven seven hundred and eighty four, some details disappear it, it is nature it is a normal thing so it so if if you set the lantern space the dimension of the lantern space even smaller the image will become worse and worse so if the uh, dimension right here the, in the lantern space become larger so the image will become the, the more details more and more diesel will be preserved in the landing space. Okay, but um, I would like to uh, mention some something about the landing space. Okay, so um, if the landing space right here, uh, if the original space will be M, and the landing space you choose is K, and <coughs> and usually when you perform some dimension reduction, and you perform some task. Okay, by using the original space, or you use the dimension reduction space. Okay, when you perform some, um, for example, classification. Okay, if you, if you would like to classify uh, the image to pants. Okay, and that is the shirt. Okay, and that is the uh, shoes. If you perform some kind of a classification by using the original data and the dimension reduction data, sometimes it will magically you use some kind of um, lantern space, which is a little bit smaller than the original space. For example, m minus m minus three, m m minus four, m minus five. Sometimes the classification accuracy may increase. When you use a space which is a little bit smaller than the original ones, the reason why is we use a smaller space and the accuracy become better is because in the original space some information may have noise. So when you perform dimension induction, some noises will be discarded, will be removed when you perform dimension reduction. But again, if you continue reduce your dimension to a smaller value, and again, there will be fewer dimension to store your information, right? So some information loss, and then it may make your classification text worse so the accuracy may decrease if you continuously reduce your dimension but at the beginning oh sorry at the beginning of dimension reduction sometimes your accuracy increased that is because the dimension reduction process removes some noises in your data okay so that's a very interesting thing. So the second example right here, we like, we like to perform image denoising. So again, okay, we uh, in this in this example, okay, we manually add some noises in the image. Okay, we manually add noises in it. And again, we use the same structures. 
the autoencoder to perform dimension reduction and reconstruct the image. And you can see that the dendent space we use, okay, the encoder we use, it indeed removes some noises. And when we reconstruct the image by using the decoder, the image become very clean. That is because when we perform dimension reduction, those noise will be removed. Okay, so again, we take a look. Uh, again, we take a look at uh, the uh, right here. Okay, um, in this second example, okay, um, Google show us some other structures to um, construct and autoencoder okay so the first one is the encoder again the, the other one is the decoder and we also still use sequential but in this case okay Google show shows that you can design your encoder and decoder in a more complex way so right here the original size is 28 by 28 and we use convolution right here it is a more complex layer, right? We don't use dense layer, we use convolution layer right here. So we have 16 kernels and each kernel ha is three by three. And we use a ReLU and we pad in, we pad in the images and the stride is two. We use a two layers of convolution to build the encoder. So as you can see that, for example, the black one is the original image, okay? Because we use the convolution, two by two convolution. So here we have a kernel right here. And we calculate the value by using the kernel weight, right? We dot product the kernel with the image. And the result will be here right and we move to the next pixel by using the stride right here so the next one will be maybe will be here and the value will be placed here and so on so forth so on so forth so you can use convolution 2d to process your data to construct your encoder by using convolution and so on so forth and as a decoder, okay, we like to introduce a new layer which is called convolution transpose. So as you can see that, that is, it is symmetric, right? It is symmetric. And the kernel size is the same, the stride is the same right here. Okay, it's still padding and there's the redo. The structure of like the encoder and decoder less symmetric. But when you use convolution 2D and encoder, you have to use convolution 2D transpose in decoder. And as you can see that the, a general form of, in, uh, of autoencoder looks like this. We have an X with <coughs> M dimension. <coughs> Sorry. And we gradually, gradually decrease the size, the space, okay, the dimension of the space to k dimension. And in the middle, that is called length space, okay, or you, we use c to represent this factor. And then we use a very similar structure right here, which is which is a symmetric, which is symmetric to the green structure to restore, to reconstru reconstruct the x prime right here okay just uh, this case we use convolution to implement the encoder and decoder okay so that is okay and uh, here is the example I would like to show you is that uh, um, as we mentioned before when you use uh, convolution okay 2d usually you will use uh, max pooling after convolution right we, we talk it we talk uh, we talked about it before, okay? But um, 
in the example provided by Google, they do not use pooling in the previous model, right? So if you really want to use the max pooling model, okay, uh, try to design the decoder as this one. Okay, you can use this one. Okay, uh, take some time to take a take a look at this uh, example. Okay, so again, okay, we use uh, Adam as an optimizer to help us to perform gradient descent, and the loss function is MSE, and we use the uh, again the trend model, and after that we we will have um, we will have a <coughs> very nice auto encoder which can remove the X the noise in big X and reconstruct the image X prime okay so th uh, that is an important um, application okay so the third X uh, the third ex uh, the third example I like to show you, which is related to um, security. Okay, um, before we talk about this um, example, uh, I'd like to mention something about the detection. And in cybersecurity, when we talk about detection, usually they are uh, they are two different uh, mainstream detection. The first one is called misuse detection, the other is called anomaly detection. Uh, when we talk about misuse detection, we talk about how do we formulate or how do we profile something which is bad, which is an attack. Okay, so maybe you can collect a data point and all those data point that belongs to bad category or attacks or a malicious software. So the target of misuse detection is something you would like to detect. So for example, we like to detect malicious software, we like to detect uh, network attacks, we like to detect if a sequence of um, calls is is um, malicious. So in these cases, when in this case, uh, you need to collect n different data points, and all of them belongs to, for example, bad examples, samples. The thing you need you want to model is the thing you would like to find, you would like to detect. So that is one detection method. But it, it, this, this kind of detection method has some shortcomings. For example, um, it is nearly impossible for some security research or so security uh, research organization, organization to collect all possible attacks. And you, you use some method to profile or to model all the attacks you collected. It is nearly impossible because you cannot collect all of them. And every day there will be new attacks will be invented or generated by the hackers. So it is impossible to do so. Um, but every time when you collect a new sample and you have a very nice method to model the sample, and then after that, you can have a very high de detection rate on those attack sample you collected. Okay, but if but if there's a new attack that you have never seen before, by using misuse detection, you will never detect those new unseen attacks. Because you have never studied them, you, your method or your neural network cannot model them, cannot detect them. So that is the reason why we have another kind of detection method, which is called anomaly detection.
The target of anomaly detection is not to detect attack. They will they will try to profile or try to model a normal behavior. Since we since we don't know how many different attacks will be observed or will be generated or will be invented in the future, so at least in our organization or in our network or in our operating system, we know what normal behavior a system should be or a network should be or a process should be. So if we can model the normal behavior, and that would be a very nice, nice thing to do. And we can set up the monitor to monitor the behavior of a operating system, to monitor the behavior of a network, a behavior of a firewall, a behavior of a anything. As long as we still observe the normal behavior, which we already we already de defined, and the system will be in a safe situation. If we monitor something that is deviated from the normal behavior. And we can set alarms to the administrator and say that, um, okay, I observed something that I don't know, which is not defined in the normal behavior. So please check. So that is another philosophy, normal uh, anomaly detection. We described what is normal and if there's a something which is deviated from normal and we say, okay, there is something anomaly, which is very, very different from misuse detection because misuse de detection only described what exactly an attack is. And it try to match the current state, the current observation to the past attacks. But misuse detection has a very high detection rate because we all we already know what is an attack. Anomaly detection can detect unseen attacks because if there's a new attack which is not defined in the normal behavior, and that is anomaly, that is an attack. And of course, sometimes if your normal behavior is not well modeled. There may be some behavior not included in your normal behavior model. So sometimes there may be false alarm. So in the in my opinion, if you want to set up a very safe environment in your organization or in your operating system, at least you need to have one misuse detection detector and you have at least one anomaly detector. They can help each other to to guard your your system. Okay, you have to model the known attacks and model the normal behavior at the same time. Okay, so um, here's another the example is called anomaly detection. Okay, so we would like to use the auto encoder to show you how to perform anomaly detection. So the example right here is ECG. Okay, that is um, electro cardiograms okay that uh, we, we are not the expert of a heart attack or a or heart but um, we simply just use this data okay so um, I'd like to show you something that um, we can simply just take a look at this figure okay uh, Google collects some data okay it has 140 data points it looks like time series but it is ECG data it is how your heart works okay so uh, that is a normal ACG it looks like this and here is another example that is anomaly ACG figure and then, as we can see that is quite different right quite different okay so we'd like to show you how how to how, how could we perform um, anomaly detection by using autoencoder so um, right here we have I think we have um, right here we have 5,000 ECG okay so we have 5,000 ECG right here 
and as you can see that okay that's just some normal things okay so uh, one of the example of normal ECG looks like this the other abnormal looks like this okay but think about one thing um, um, when we perform anomaly detection as you mentioned before the 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 only thing you need to model is the normal behavior. So when you perform anomaly detection, the data set you have only need to include the normal behavior models. For example, we have 5,000 ECG, right? We only need to include the normal ECG in our data set. It is not binary classification. For binary classification, you have normal data, you have abnormal data, and you use all your features right here. Okay, it has 140 features. And you can set up a neural network to perform binary classification. That is one way to do so. But in this case, we perform anomaly detection. We don't need abnormal data. We only need normal data. Okay, so in these cases, we use all those 5,000 normal ECG data, and each of them is a vector, okay, 140. <coughs> uh, the size is 140. And we design an encoder and a decoder. Okay, the encoder is a dense network, okay, it's gradually decrease its dimension. And at the end, okay, at the end, the landing space, the size of length and space dimension is eight, and we have a symmetric structure of the decoder. Okay, to sixteen, uh, thirty-two, and to one hundred and forty. And again, we use these two values and calculate those function. And one thing you need to know is that the ECG value will be between. Um, 0, 0.0 to 1.0 so at the end again okay at the end of this decoder okay we use sigmoid activation functions to make the result will be between 0, 0.0 to 1.0 and for the all the other layers we can use any activation function you'd like and we use red loop for example Okay, so that is an autoencoder. In this autoencoder, we don't need Y, but we need all the info, all the data data point in this data set is normal ECG. We don't have Y. You have to make sure you understand that. Okay, um, one one interesting thing is that the loss function they choose right here as MAE. Okay, it's MAE, but it really doesn't matter you choose MAE or MSE, okay? So again, we train the data set, okay? And after that, <coughs> we will have a trend encoder, okay? Theta E, and here we have Theta D. We, we will have the optimized Theta E and Theta D. So after that, we can, after time, every time we have a new ECG, we can input it into the encoder and then again input it into a decoder and get the reconstruct ECG. Okay, take a look at this one. Okay. The blue one is the original ECG, which is the big X, right? And the red one is the reconstruct ECG. So you, we have an encoder, right? We have an encoder, and you put the big X, and we get the Z, and you put the Z into a decoder, and we have a X prime, right? So the blue one is the input, the red one is the reconstruct. And as we mentioned before, because we have a very very small landing space right here, it has only eight dimension so some information of the big X will be lost in the encoder and the decoder cannot reconstruct 
the information loss. So the output of x dot x prime will be a little bit different from the input, the green one and uh, the, the blue one. So we can, uh, since we use the MS, MAE right here, right? We use the MAE. So basically, MAE is the arrow between blue line and the red line. So basically, the MAE is the area of this red area so if the decoder has um, maybe larger than the space maybe the arrow will be smaller the area will be smaller okay but it really doesn't matter okay let's take a look at the what if we put an abnormal sample in our encoder and decoder and as you can see that the the abnormal sample the in input right here it looks strange that they, they look strange right so after we reconstruct the abnormal sample as you can see that the ar arrow area become bigger that is because the the optimized theta e and theta d We'll try to reconstruct the normal samples, right? Theta E and Theta D never trend by abnormal sample. They only know, they only trend by normal sample. So if you input an um, abnormal sample right here, they will try to reconstruct with the knowledge of normal samples. And as you can see that the, er the reconstruction error will be larger. So let's uh, make some um, statistics, okay? So here, that is, we input um, of the normal samples in the encoder and the decoder, and here, is the loss which is the MAE value right where is the error area and as you can see that most of the normal samples their reconstruction error will be less than 0 0.04 which means they can reconstruct the normal samples quite well and of course there are some samples which cannot be construct, reconstruct well. But most of them will be less than 0 0.04. And here, if you use abnormal samples to perform such kind of reconstruction, and as you can see, those arrow, the reconstruction arrow, most of them will be larger than 0 0.04. And of course, some of them will be right here. So that is how we use an autoencoder to model a normal behavior or a normal image. Because those autoencoders only know how to reconstruct normal samples. So if you give them, if you give this autoencoder uh, an abnormal sample, it will be it, the, the decoder and the encoder will reconstruct the image, the, the ECG image, will quite bad. So right here you can see that the reconstruction error will be larger. So in this case, we show you how to use autoencoder to perform anomaly detection. Okay. Take it. Take a, uh, take some time to take a look at this um, class note. Okay, we stop right here, and we will talk about uh, some other things later.